anthropologists say, oh yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, so an anthropologists say that political systems evolved through four stages. First, there are groups of families living together in units that they call bands, B-A-N-D-S, bands. Later, that evolved into tribes. Still later, were what anthropologists call chiefdoms or kingdoms, and most recently, the nation state. Many argue that the next natural step in this evolution of political systems would be at the regional level. And they point to the European Union as the most developed example. So if that's true, then the path to a world federation might be a two-step process. First, to integrate the regions, and then in a matter of speaking, you just connect the dots. In other words, you bring the regional federations together into one world federation. But that still leaves us with the question, how would you go about unifying on that regional level? So our next speaker, Fernando Iglesias, has come up with a strategy to do just that in Latin America and the Caribbean through the creation of a regional court to fight drug trafficking, sex trafficking, and other forms of organized crime. Fernando is co-president of the World Federalist Movement's Executive Committee. He was twice a member of the parliament in Argentina. And if I understand correctly, just today, he finished campaigning for another term as a parliament minister, which might explain why he doesn't have the link right now. <laughs> he, he let us know he might be called, oh, I see him there, terrific. Okay, that's him, yes. All right, I'm almost done introducing you, perfect timing. Okay, so hopefully we'll hear a little bit more about that election as well. Fernando is director of the Campaign for Latin American and Caribbean Criminal Court Against Transnational Organized Crime, and he's the co-chair of the, UN, the UNPA's Campaign Parliamentary Advisory Group. As a university professor, he specialized in the political aspects of globalization, publishing several books, including Republic of the Earth, Globalizing Democracy, and Global Modernity. Fernando is based in Buenos Aires and speaks Spanish as his native language, as well as English, French, Italian, and Portuguese. As with all of our speakers, Fernando will present for about 30 to 35 minutes, and then we'll take questions. Donna will continue on as timekeeper, and please place your questions in the chat window and direct them to me so they'll stand out from all the other conversations there. In a moment, I'll place the website for the Latin American court in the chat window, but for now, it's my pleasure to introduce Fernando Iglesias. Fernando? Hi, Bob. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to arrive a little late. It was, I was campaigning and this Sunday we had the poll. So, you know, it's a very stressing and exciting moment uh, for a parliamentarian. This will be my third term and I, I expect to, to confirm my, my position at the, at the chamber, uh, maybe also as the president of the committee of Mercosur in the chamber, which I am. Uh, and this is a very interesting position, particularly for the, the topic we are discussing now. Thank you very, very much for the invitation. It's a, a long way of uh, my cooperation and relationship with, uh, uh, with uh, the American Federalist Organization, particularly with the uh, citizens. For global solution, I see, but I see people from the very old friends. Uh, so, uh, friends from a long time. That's better. Uh, I'm sorry for I'm sorry for my English. It's not that good, but it's I, I, I do my best. Um, well, thank you very much for your invitation, Bob, Donna, and all all, all of you. And I I'm I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make a. Um, the case in favor of the COPLA, but trying to understand the context. I think for you, it's more important the context and the specific campaign. We are going to finish uh, explaining the, the specific campaign. 
but the the framework the 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 situation is very i think it's very interesting in order to to discuss what's going on about uh, the path to towards a world federation and about the um, uh, the um, regional integration as part of the process first uh, the national order has had an, at least three centuries from the Westphalia, it was 106, uh, 48, to about three centuries uh, after, uh, at the end of the uh, Second World War, national states were the center of everything. So the center of uh, identity, citizenship, economy, uh, politics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the fast development of uh, uh, the economy, the second industrial revolution particularly, um, overcame the dimension of the national states. And we have, of course, the contradiction between the expansion of the economy and the techno economy and the limitation, the territorial limitation of the state was uh, the source of every kind of crisis, which finished in two world wars, a genocide, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of you are federalists. You know this. I'm not going to insist on this on this topic, but the basic thing was this contradiction that the world faced at the beginning of the past century with in, in Europe, and it was Europe because it was Europe the most developed in uh, uh, continent in terms of economy and technology and at the same time it was uh, at the same time it was this the, the same continent was the smaller uh, the smallest one in terms of the dimension of their of the national states the conflict was served there and that's why we had two world wars in Europe at the end of those war at the at the end of the second war, uh, humanity understood, or many uh, parts of humanity understood that we need some political innovation to move forward through the idea of a national state at the hegemonic center of everything and the idea of uh, absolute sovereignty. And two big institutions were created at the global level the United Nations, at the regional level, the European Union. And they have different paths, different uh, um, histories, but they were um, capable of avoiding the risk of a third world war. So both the United Nations and the European Union, with all their limitations, they were able to develop the basic function they were created for, which was not uh, carrying to paradise into, into the war, but avoiding the hell, which was the Third World War. Well, where we are now, is regional integration a path to a world federation? I don't think this is a sequential um, situation. I don't think we are going to federate every region of the world, and then we are going to, this is uh, the vision of many European federalists for many years, but I think this is out. As, uh, but at the same time, the, the federation at the regional level is a very important uh, way of avoiding conflicts and showing to, to the potentiality of federalism, uh, the supranational federalism uh, for uh, all the rest of the world. European Union, the European Union is important not only because it has kept the peace in Europe, and it has uh, been the most advanced um, political experiment for in the history of humanity, changing from a devastated continent to another one, which is uh, a model in terms of uh, democracy and human rights, maybe the most developed one together maybe with uh, North America and some other exceptions. Uh, but it's also important, the European integration, because um, 
it, it is a, a model for the world. I'm not saying that the world has to copy the European model, but I'm saying that the, the role of the European Union in order to promote supranational federalism is crucial for all of us in the path towards a world federation. What else? Um, it's very important to think about how the European integration proceeded. Uh, it started at the, at the middle of the past century with the economic um, community of uh, carbon and steel, the SECA, in, in, in my uh, abbreviation terms. So, the Comunità Europea del Carbon y el Acero. And it was understood as a model of economic integration. The basic idea, the predominant, still now, is the predominant idea is that the European uh, integration is about economy. So the uh, European community of carbon and steel, and then the European economic community, and then the uh, European Union and the Euro, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is true, but since I, I don't think this is uh, complete, the complete truth. When the SICA was created, the community of carbon and steel. It was not created in order to integrate economically Europe. It was created in order to avoid conflict. In current terms, we would, sh should have called this process as a conflict prevention strategy, because it was carbon and steel. And the idea was if France and, Ger and Germany, together with other European countries, control the carbon and the steel, they cannot develop national armies in order to make an aggression to the another countries. And they are not, they will won't be fighting each other for Alsacia, which was the cause of three big wars, Alsacian and Prussian uh, war in 1871. And the first and the second world war started by the conflict between France and Germany for the carbon in Alsacia, because the country who had the, the carbon, it will be the um, industrial power in future. So it was not about the economic integration. It was basically about the prevention of a conflict, of a, another conflict in Europe. That was the basic strategy uh, in, in Europe. And we have to think this about why, uh, because, uh, Regional integration in Europe was a part of, of a very specific period uh, of, um, of the technological uh, evolution. It was late industrialism, advanced industrialism, the last part of, industri uh, of industrialism in which uh, um, the power of industry and the capacity of connection have transcended completely the national level, but it was not still global. And we are leaving this uh, period uh, behind us because we are entering clearly another stage in civilization, which is the global society of information. If you, pro if you produce a car of, with very uh, developed technologies and advanced technology and so on, you have still a car and selling the car uh, all abroad uh, at the other part at the other stream of the world is very difficult it's, it costs a lot of money and you don't have the control of the market etc cetera, etc cetera. so if you produce a car your market is national and it's basically re regional that's why economic integration works so well at the regional level but no, we are producing other kind of things which are really more important. So Facebook or I don't know, Google or whatever, or this kind of uh, new enterprise, which um, they don't produce uh, objects. They don't pro produce uh, things industrially. They are part of a society based on knowledge and information. And when you produce, I don't know, uh, uh, an, app, an app or a software program, your market is the world. It's not regional anymore. So 
Regional integration is facing a big defy, uh, which is the basic need of building a regional market for advancing industrialism is not over, but it's being every year less important and the necessity of uh, entering the global market it's every year more important. In fact, the, the race for artificial intelligence is not guided by Europe, but by the United States and China. And this is a very high defy. First for Europe, functionalism was right about moving forward the agenda of uh, European integration through economy. They were right and they were successful. No, it's time for federalism because the reasons are not economic anymore for regional integration. We had to find another way, another reason for political integration at the regional level. And this is the moment of entering Latin America. I don't want to I have scarce time, but uh, for years we have developed the Mercosur the common market between Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay, uh, with the idea of reproducing at the Latin America and basically in South America, the, the regional integration uh, made uh, by, uh, through the European process. But you're, about halfway, you're about halfway through your time. Thank you. Halfway. Uh, halfway. Can you 13 more minutes. You're halfway through your time. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Donna. Very, <laughs> very well. So I have about 10 minutes. Okay. Let, let me be as far as 13. Okay. Um, well, you know, um, it was a failure. It was a failure first because we didn't have advanced industrialism. We were not so close and so populated like Europe. And we had a big country, Brazil, which was half of the entire continent in terms of territory, population, and GDP. So the reproduction of the um, economic strategy for South America in order to uh, integrate the region was a failure. And we are in the middle of a Mercosur, which is having big trouble inside and we had an, uh, an agreement, a very important agreement with the European Union, but we know we don't agree every country. Uh, so Argentina was, during our government, uh, it was the impulse of this agreement, but now Argentina in the hands of the current government is against the agreement, so it's a big mess. And I don't think this is a good strategy. That's why we, um, South American federalists, we uh, used, we came back to the start of the European Union and we think, what did Europeans do uh, in that moment at the beginning? They had a strategy of conflict prevention. They had, they focused in a single problem of Europe, which was war. So we are trying to make the same thing here because the basic problem we had here in, Sudan, in Latin America is organized crime. And that's why we are proposing as the strategy of regional integration, not economic integration, even if we support economic integration and we are in favor of the agreement between Mercosur and the European Union, but we are proposing something different a regional code, something very similar of the, um, to the um, uh, International Criminal Code, but not directed to uh, crimes against humanity, but directed to fight against the most important source of human rights violation, violation in our uh, continent, which is organized crime. And then if you, uh, Bob has the PowerPoint. I'm gonna use the PowerPoint to explain as soon as fast as possible, which is the strategy. This is Latin American and Caribbean criminal court against organized crime. Organized crime is defined by a United Nations convention, the Palermo Convention, uh, 
uh, it's very well defined and we took this definition. Next, please. Why? Next. And this uh, show the, the following one, which is the map, I think. Please, next. This is. These are the numbers. So, you, you know, this is the number of crimes in 100,000 um, people uh, every year, three people die in Europe, two got three in Asia, 13 in Africa, two got eight in Oceania, 27 in Mexico, 24 in Belize, 46 in Jamaica, 37 in Honduras, 24 in Colombia, 28 in Trinidad and Tobago, 45 in Venezuela. I don't see Brazil, but Brazil is about the Mex Mexican uh, numbers, which is 25. So we are speaking of a, a level which is, which double the situation in Africa, and it's eight times uh, worse than in Europe, for instance. We are speaking about Mexico. What does it mean for Mexico? It means that about 30,000 people die every year in Mexico because crimes connected with uh, um, international, transnational crimes, like, you know, uh, drug trafficking, human trafficking, um, arms trafficking, and all these kind of uh, atrocities. And in Brazil, it's even worse. Brazil has arrived some years ago to 60,000 people were killed in a single year, which is more than the worst performance in Libya, in Syria, in the worst moment of the war. Next, that's why this is the, the, the level of um, gravity of, of the problem, which is connected with a, a lot of aspects. Nobody's going to invest money and to develop a region in this condition. The corruption is high, and the menaces to democracy are rising, and the violation of human rights are, have this source as the most important source in our countries. Institutional design of the core. I'm going to be very fast. This is, if I have to say this in one phrase, in order to uh, respect the times fixed by Donna, thank you. <laughs> it's, I will say that. Uh, it's, it's like the International Criminal Code, but we don't have the Statute of Rome about uh, crimes against humanity. We have the, the Palermo Convention of the United Nations against transnational uh, crime. Next, please. Okay, next, please. This is included. Uh, this is very important, a very important thing. You see the, the map, and almost all, all the countries in our region, Latin America, see the, your, your left, um, it, almost all the countries have ratified the Palermo Convention. So this is the base of our rationality. If a country is in favor of the Convention of Palermo, why don't we create a code which basic function is to empower, to act, to enact the Palermo Convention all, all over the, the region. Next. Well, this is uh, the basic uh, crimes which are defined by the Palermo Convention. You know, uh, drugs, uh, drug trafficking, uh, firearms trafficking, um, trafficking in person, child trafficking and prostitution, uh, smuggling of migrants, trafficking of cultural property, money laundering, and transnational bribery, which is very important considering the high levels of corruption in our governments. Next. And this is the campaign. Next, please. Well, we, we have support for very, very uh, important um, institution. I think the most important ones are the parliaments, 
we have a strategy which connects civil society, politicians and leaders and you know Nobel Prizes and so on, but also parliamentarians. We had a positive resolution by the Argentine Senate uh, and the Argentine Chamber and the Mercosur Parliament and the many other, uh, um, and the Paraguay uh, Chamber and so on. Next one, please. Well, um, we had also a strategy based on the jury part of this, which is we are trying to develop uh, an institute in order to invite the governments to understand which is the proposal about and to ratify in future the agreement. And we have many, many um, international organizations based uh, directed to the juridical aspects uh, which are signed the document and are part of the campaign. Yes, finishing, last one. Five, five more minutes, you can talk for five more five minutes. Five more minutes, <laughs> thank you. Okay, okay, the Paraguay support for the Ecuadorian group of uh, Parliamentaria for Global Action and many other uh, members of the, we have a declaration of Buenos Aires in support, the Eurolat, uh, which is the chamber between the regional um, members of parliament uh, of um, South America, Latin America, and uh, Europe have signed also the document, the, our document. Next. And we created also an anti-mafia seminar with the Italian uh, parliament and the Direzione Nazionale Anti-Mafia, which is the most, one of the most important institution against organized crime all over the world. You know, uh, they are the uh, Italian Eliotness, let's say it like, like this. They, they, have, they are the prosecutors all over it, Italy and they are connected, I, they are trying, they have developed the strategies in order to, uh, to, to prosecute criminals all over Italy in connection, every prosecutor with each other. We, uh, and we think this is a very interesting strategy to, to apply also to Latin America to connect all those who are fighting separately, but trying to, to create this kind of connections. And as we created this seminar, we are going to have uh, the next edition, I hope, uh, next year in Rome. And next, next, how can you contribute? You can sign the petition at our page, uh, um, web page, which is coalicioncopla.org. Uh, you can share contacts with NGO and we, you can collaborate with Democracy Global with, with your time, contacts and skills. And of course, donations are very welcome. You know, we are very poor and every single dollar is a lot of money for us right now. Next, the coalition for Copla. Next. It includes a lot of different kind of organization. You can see there, uh, the World Face Movement Canada and Science Social is uh, a very important organization in this in Mexico, which is one of the countries who have a more active civil society in this. The COPAC, which is the global organization of parliamentarians against corruption and many other uh, organizations. Next one. The same. Next one. Democracy Without Borders is also the World Face Movement Institute for Global Policy, of course, is part of the campaign. Next one. This is uh, our, um, our page. You can enter there and you can have the contact with Camila Lopez Valera. I am the director of the campaign, she is the coordinator and you, your contribution are very welcome. And for finishing, if you agree, Bob, I will show you the, well, we, we had lost something when we lost the government two years ago, because we had the national government, the Argentine government, President Macri, 
was in favor of this initiative, and also the vice president, Gabriela Michetti. Gabriela Michetti was our vice president, and she was uh, the senator who uh, proposed at the Argentine Senate the declaration in favor of the creation of the uh, Latin American Criminal Court, and it was approved by the unanimity uh, some four years ago. But we lost the government. Anyway, they, before they left the, um, the government, they made these two statements at the Assembly, General Assembly of the United Nations about what we were doing when we were uh, the Argentine government. And I hope we are going to, to be again in two years, the national government. Uh, we had a, a high chance of that. And I hope we recover this level because of course, the support of a single government, uh, particularly of Argentina, which has, uh, is the second, uh, considering also Mexico is the third country in uh, territory, population and GDP in the region is very important and particularly because the um, topic of human rights uh, and the leadership of Argentina about human rights, uh, human rights is very important in the region. So I will close and I'm open for your questions and let's see the, the President uh, Macri and Gabriela Michetti saying this message at the United Nations General so, Affairs. Fernando, let me just cut in to say that we, we can show the films, but um, that would be cutting into your the time for questions and answers. So my recommendation would just be to okay. show one of them rather than both. If okay, Macri, Macri, see now, please. Okay. This is Miketi, it's okay. Janet, you probably have to unmute yourself, Janet. Fronteras. Tenemos que cooperar y unir nuestros esfuerzos para enfrentarlo. La lucha contra el narcotráfico es otro de los tres ejes del programa de nuestro presidente. Es esencial redoblar el compromiso internacional para hacer frente a este flagelo. En este sentido, estamos trabajando desde la Argentina para encontrar los consensos que nos permitan constituir en nuestra región de América Latina el Tribunal Latinoamericano contra el Crimen Organizado. El consenso en la justicia impide la consagración de la impunidad. Y este es el Vivimos en un mundo que no está exento a graves amenazas, la como el crimen organizado, la, la ciberdelincuencia, el terrorismo, que requieren respuestas cooperativas para hacerle frente. Tribunal que nos permita en estos específicamente años, mirar con voluntad política y mayor cooperación con nuestros socios de la región y del mundo. Ser la manifestación de la Hemos logrado aumentar la cantidad de droga incautada. Por eso nosotros adherimos a este iniciativa. Desarticular redes criminales de narcotráfico. Es una de las a su vez, construir seguimos buscando los consensos necesarios para diseñar una instancia judicial complementaria a nivel regional. Y así lo... Ok. Ok, it was a little confusing because we had overlap the declaration the words of Macri at the United Nation with a, a ceremony, a, an, act, um, an event we organized at the chamber uh, of, the, of the National Chamber with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, for it. Uh, thank you very much, Bob. Okay, so we, we already have questions in the chat box. I want to invite anybody who has a question to add that into the chat. So I'll start with the first one, Fernando. It's from Lee Davis. And the question is, is the next step a council of representatives of regional groups? Well, this, this is the dream of my friend Lucho Levy to change the undemocratic structure of the 
uh, security council. I, I, I think he's speaking about that. And of course, in the ideal design of uh, a rational world, uh, the security council should be composed by regions and uh, with no veto power, with the rule of majority and so on. And of course, this is our hope. But by using the, the phrase of Jean Monnet, there was a, this discussion about uh, um, European integration between uh, Altiero Spinelli, which uh, climbed for a uh, um, constitutional assembly and let's put uh, a united Europe on the table right now. And Jean Monnet answered uh, him that the a united uh, Europe and an integrated Europe was the end of the, of the, of the road, not the beginning. Uh, I sympathize, I, I'm the director of the Spinelli Cathedral, but I admit that Jean Monnet had also his reason. I would say that this is a very good idea to have a security council at the United Nations composed by the regions, but I think this is not for tomorrow. This is the end of a very important fight we have to, to, to do. I, and I think the basic thing on this, I, I, for reforming the United Nations, we need democratic legitimacy. United Na Nations are with the people, but in reality is with the nations. And if we want to change that, nations, uh, the governors are not going to be with us. So we need to uh, force them. And the way of forcing them is through democratic legitimacy. And in this sense, I think the United Nations Parliamentary Assembly strategy, the creation of a UNPA um, would be the best strategy in order to, uh, for different things, for climate change and pandemic and so on, but also for the reform of the United Nations, we need to have some kind of democratic body who represents the voice of the citizens of the world and the UNPA campaign is the best strategy in my opinion right now. Okay. Thank you. So Fernando, the next question is rather long. So if you don't have your chat uh, window open, I would suggest you do it so you can follow along, but I will read it so that it gets on the recording. It's from Peter Davidson. And the question is the EU comes to a natural border in between the Russian Federation and the US of North America and Canada. On the level of the UN regions, the EU is a sub-regional organization surpassed by NATO, the OCSE, the Council of Europe, also UN chapter eight organizations. Our next level up from the nation state is now the Eurasian continent. A corruption and fighting organized crime is very valuable. My question concerns another topic. Some decades ago in Latin America, military dictatorships were very present. Our esteemed Dutch world federalist, Professor Theo van Boven, for instance, was very active in that, in that human rights area. What is your reflection on military dictatorships in America? What about torture practices by states, not only Cuba? Just give me a moment in order to close the door. Okay. Sorry, my dog. So, well, yes, of course, I, I was, uh, I was part of the resistance against uh, military dictatorship from 1981 to 1987 when I went to Europe. I was militant of many of uh, the movement of human rights here in Argentina. And I know very close uh, the situation and that's why. So I think there are many different things to, to say about that. Uh, no, the 
danger of uh, traditional military dictatorships is not so high here. Maybe the, uh, because the military were completely rejected by most of the population, but because of the crimes they committed. Uh, in Argentina, it's unthinkable. They came back of the, uh, they come back of the militaries to the, to the national power. Maybe Brazil is an exception, uh, but I don't see any menace, uh, menace to uh, human rights by traditional uh, right uh, mil military dictatorships. Uh, the real menace, the real menace are, in my opinion, two. One is uh, um, transnational crime. If you lose 70, 60,000 people in one year, like, um, like Brazil some years ago, so this is a menace to democracy, human rights, and so on. Second, I think there are very high violation of human rights not only in Cuba, particularly in Venezuela. And this is not a rightist opinion. You know, Michelle Bachelet is in charge of uh, human rights at the United Nations. She was uh, a center-left president uh, with uh, he, um, her father was assassinated by uh, Pinochet in Chile. So it's uh, unthinkable she's part of a, a plot against Venezuela. The problem with Venezuela is very high. We are speaking about uh, hundred and thousand of uh, people who are in jail or they were murdered, etc. And the Bachelet's report for the United Nations is very clear about that. And good news on that is that the International Criminal Code, for the first time, accepted the motion moved by many of the uh, South American countries uh, plus Canada in order to uh, judge um, the, the Venezuelan governors because of crimes against humanity. And this is something which is very, very important. So military, so the Venezuelan dictatorship is a military dictatorship. The only way this uh, govern the govern the Venezuelan government can support and be, par be still at power is because they have the support of the military forces and the military forces support this government because of drugs because of drug trafficking they are controlling this in all the region and this is a danger for the other countries this is about the uh, human rights about the rest uh, of course, there are many other uh, organizations like OCDE and other kind of um, um, institutions which are very important in the new structure. I just quoted the United Nations and uh, European Union because uh, the, this has uh, another level. So um, the, I think the basic thing in future for us is how to combine at the global level, two principles we respect at the national level, which are democracy and federalism. And we had this experience at the national level, uh, uh, starting by the United States, but also Brazil and Argentina and so on. But, and we had this experiment of uh, combining, um, combining, I'm sorry, uh, democracy and federalism at the uh, at the supranational level, which is Europe. This is the importance I, uh, I see in the European experiment for the rest of the world. Okay. Thank you, Fernando. Our next question comes from Holly, which is, is the OAS still viable and does it participate or cooperate with Coppola? A uh, very good question. You know, why not a Pan-American criminal code, you know? For different reasons. The basic reason was, if you put the United States and Canada, particularly the United States, in the soup, uh, Latin American countries, you are going to face a strong opposition, not by all the forces, but by many of the forces. So this is an impossible project. 
unfortunately, I'm not against, but um, if you, uh, if your project is a Pan American uh, code against blah, 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 you will have the strong opposition of at least uh, a third or a, a half of the Latin American spectrum. And everybody is going to suspect that you are putting the hands of the United States inside Latin America and so on. So, uh, unfortunately, we have to be pragmatic. And I think that Latin American is a good level uh, because it includes many other people insisted about, don't think about Latin America, just South America or only the Mercosur. Okay, I'm not against that, but I think that the, the country in which maybe the, the situation about um, uh, transnational organized crime uh, is really heavy, heavy and very difficult is uh, Mexico. You cannot have something without Mexico, you need Mexico. But at the same time, uh, the possibility of having uh, the North America together uh, is not very practical and pragmatical. On the contrary, I think one of the first person I met with this project of uh, the Latin American Criminal Court was Emma Bonino. One of my friends, maybe you know her, she was the um, chair of the, the speaker of the Italian Senate. She was the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Italy. And I had an interview with her when she was in charge. And she said, very well idea. Do you do this in Latin America, but don't keep uh, keep always in mind this has to be global. And I agree. If we are able to uh, have uh, a code like this at the Latin American level, we could be an example in order to create another one or to extend the experiment to other regions. And the reason we are uh, pushing for the Latin American level is because we are here first and because the gravity of the situation connected with transnational crime, as I show you, is uh, really more uh, decisive for uh, Latin America than for any other country. Great. Uh, thank you, Fernando. The next question comes from Robin Lloyd, who asks, wouldn't the best step be to deal to, to wouldn't the best step to deal with this corruption be to legalize drugs and to change the UN position on drugs? Well, yeah, th this is uh, one of the discussions going on from the beginning, because there is a very important part of the society which claims in favor of the legalization of drugs. They use uh, the ex example of the of alcohol during the, the in North America and the United States during the the beginning of the century, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I think it's a very dangerous experiment, but I'm not completely. I, I, in my opinion is nobody knows. Nobody knows which are the effects, and we have to respect this possibility, I'm not against that. In any case, if the problem of drug trafficking uh, disappears, we will still have the problem of transnational uh, crime. Because of course, the criminals are not going to say, okay, this is over, let's go, let's go home, uh, forget it, and so on. They are going to use to reinforce all the other sources of revenues, which are human trafficking, uh, traffic of arms, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the problem is not only if, even if the main source of criminality is drug trafficking, this is not the only one. And of course, if drug trafficking disappears, we are going to see the reinforcement of the, all the other kind of crime. So, the necessity of having a criminal court to fight against that remains. Great. Thank you, Fernando. Our next question comes from Chris Hamer, who asks, which nations do you want to start with? The whole of Latin America or a smaller group of progressive states like the six in Europe? 
Well, oh, another very good question. Well, we, so at the beginning we say five plus five, you know, about five uh, nations uh, uh, among which we should have at least one of the three biggest ones. So if you have um, just uh, two nations, Argentina and Brazil, and that's it, this is not uh, enough. You need to have at least five na nations. But at the same time, you, if you have five, five na nations and you don't have Mexico, Brazil, uh, neither Argentina, so it's not enough. So at least five nations and one of the three biggest ones could be a good start. This is our idea. Uh, we say also five because of years. In five years, about five nations, including a, a big one. Um, unfortunately, we were very optimistic as, you, as usual. And unfortunately, we lost the support of uh, the national Argentine government because we lost the government. So we, we were very advanced in many things and now we are back and we are trying to keep the flame alive uh, in order to restart maybe convincing, maybe because uh, my political group, Cambiemos Juntos por el Cambio, come back in future for, uh, to, the, to the government, or maybe because we are able to convince another national government, we are trying, we have contacts with different uh, national governments, but it's not that easy to, to, and we don't have money enough to have a regional campaign. We, we, are, we try to have a regional campaign. I went to Mexico, I went to almost each country in the region, but the campaign is based on Buenos Aires and the team is always here and we are keeping the contacts and saying, sending messages but basically, to be frank, we had a national campaign in favor of a regional. Uh, unless we 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 have uh, we find you know George Soros or somebody who is willing to support a regional campaign, this is our reality. Uh, for that is uh, the the, the um, Argentine government uh, and the support of the national Argentine government is so important for us. We have time for one last question, Bob. Okay, and that question will go to Tom Camarilla, who asks, is there going to be any crimes regarding the environment since it affects the whole world? Yeah, this is a very good question too. Uh, no, the answer is no. <laughs> well, you know, this is a very difficult campaign. It's, you think you are dealing uh, Latin America, everybody speaks very good uh, about Latin Americans. We are, we thank all of you. We had very good opinions. We are friendly. We have tango, we have Brazilian music. We are so nice, you know. Which is the most uh, unfair social justice? Which is the most unfair uh, region in the world? Africa? No, Latin America. Which is the most violent uh, region in the world? No? Africa? No, Latin America. And which is the most corrupted region of the world? Of the, world? the governments, I mean. Africa? No, Latin America. You know? So don't think so good about us. <laughs> we, we, we are, you know, a little. We have very good uh, dancers, tango dancers, and, and Brazilian music, and uh, the climate is uh, perfect, and, and so on. But, you know, it's very, you think, I'm saying this because we have to deal with national governments among the most corrupted ones in the world. And we have to convince them to create an organism to uh, fight against corruption. Not that easy, first thing. So we are trying to be as pragmatic as possible. The project is very ambitious. So we have to be very modest in, in our, in our, in the way we uh, propose the, the project. And one of the things we, we thought was this, 
If we start now to discuss which is transnational uh, crime, we are not going to finish anymore because we South Americans, we are the leaders about speaking and speaking and speaking and discussing and discussing and doing nothing. So what are the instruments we have already in the international landscape about this? We have a convention, a United Nations convention, the Palermo Convention that was signed by almost all the countries in the region. That's it. That's our convention. Don't discuss anything about that. Just if, you, and our way of discussing with the governments is, is your government, is your country in favor of fighting against transnational working group? Uh, excuse me, transnational crime? It, because you have a commitment because your country is part of the Palermo Convention. So why don't, why don't we create a, a tribunal in order to enforce this? Are you against that? Why? This is a very difficult question to, to, to answer for corrupt um, uh, governments. And it opens the opportunity for the opposition. You know, the national government is part of a country which signed the Palermo Convention against international crime. Okay, but the government is against the, to the creation of a court. Then the opposition say, if we go to the government, we are going to promote this code because this is a corrupted government and so on. So this could be part of a process in which every country is forced, the national government is forced to agree about the creation of the, of the code. This is the design. And of course, if we are going to discuss about putting new crimes inside the Palermo Convention, I think this is going, this is going to be uh, too much for, for the reality we can uh, uh, afford in next year. Great. Well, thank you, Fernando. Before we take a break and have 10 minutes of tango dancing, as you uh, just brought up a moment ago, uh, I have two bits of business. First, a question to you. Uh, you may not have seen this with, uh, with your busy campaign schedule, um, but we do have breakout rooms 